For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sash Niwadi. Joining me today is author Roy Haverman, here to discuss his book, How to Fix a Country, Six Things to Reboot South Africa. Your book lays out six focus areas to move South Africa towards success, and you start off with ESCOM. You draw on the experiences of China, Greece, and Colombia, which overcame their own load shedding problems. What can we learn from these countries? As you mentioned, China, Greece, and Colombia have all experienced a version of load shedding. They called it something different. Uh, they called it black arts or brown arts or uh, power cuts, which is, I guess, a clearer word or maybe a more honest way of putting it. But what they did is they shifted the responsibility for generation away from state-owned enterprises uh, into more independently owned power producers. Um, China actually being a really good example. And I make the point that China did this quite rapidly after they faced their own brown arts problem. Uh, similarly, Colombia has also moved away from a reliance on hydroelectricity, also to more renewables. And Greece is very, very interesting because, as you know, it's a, it's actually has many islands and it's very, very difficult to run an electricity um, grid through the islands. And so they've had to be very creative about how they make sure each island has electricity and how they found that to work the best is actually with renewables on each island. So I use them as examples for how best, what we can do to, to move away from load shedding. Now, you also say in your book that there is a clear link between education and economic growth. What solutions do you propose to improve in this important area? So I propose three solutions. Uh, the first is a back to basics. Um, so there's a lot of research on the effects of reading, particularly at a younger level. Uh, and there I recommend that what we do is we have a, a build out the existing reading campaign, which is really highly focused on getting children to be able to read for meaning from a very young age. All the surveys, so there are international tests on reading, and they all show that we do terribly in reading. Uh, and that includes uh, mother tongue reading. So one of the things that many education suggest is actually to teach children how to read in their own mother tongue, which of course in this country I think is very important. The second component of it is to build out ECD, so early childhood development. Uh, there's been a lot of research that has shown that the younger you start with children, the better their life success is, and particularly learning outcomes are later. And that's often related to how they do uh, in the classroom environment. So children that have got exposure to ECD um, from a very young age are often better at, at being able to sit still in the class, being able to listen to the teacher, being more disciplined, even very much later in life. And I mean, I don't think that's particularly surprising to anyone who's ever had to deal with a five-year-old or a four-year-old, is that these are sort of life lessons that have to be learned quite young. And, and the third component is about nutrition. So it's really sad that in South Africa, many of the children uh, come to school hungry and unable to learn because they can't sit still. And there's some very interesting experiments where uh, schools have opted into the national school feeding scheme. And it's been very interesting to see how quickly those schools have improved their learning outcomes. So those are three big areas. The one other area that I really delve into and, and discuss is it's interestingly and a little bit controversial sometimes in the education space, which is to allow children from poor backgrounds access to the best government schools. And I use the example of Michelle Robinson, who later married Barack Obama, who went to uh, an academy school in Chicago and was incredibly successful after that. And even in South Africa, the case of Sia Khaleesi, who won a rugby scholarship to a government school in South Africa, and is an incredibly talented man. And I think exposure to that school just brought out all his talents. Now, when discussing the environment, what is the solution for South Africa when it comes to advancing the country's energy transition away from a country that is largely dependent on coal? So what must we do to ensure that we don't fall behind as the rest of the world moves on to cleaner energy? Yeah, well, one of the big things I highlight is that the world is really turning against coal in a very rapid way. So there's something called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism in the European Union, which punishes countries which have high carbon emissions uh, and imposes a tax on their goods when they come into the country. And of course, South Africa has a very high percentage of our, our manufacturing is produced is carbon intensive because 
we obviously use Eskim for that carbon. And so we really need to move quite rapidly to do two things. One is to increase the carbon tax so that the revenue on the tax can remain in South Africa. But secondly, is to slowly transition to uh, renewable energy. I make the point that we're in an energy crisis, which ironically makes the transition easier because there's no need to accelerate the closure of the coal stations at the moment. We actually need to add new electricity. You know, in other countries, actually, they, they have too much electricity sometimes, and so they have to close coal power stations quicker than they would usually. We can just slowly but surely close the coal power stations as they reach the end of their lives, uh, and at the same time add new electricity sources to the grid, particularly renewables and sun and wind, and, and that will allow us to, to have a managed transition. Now, you say that South Africa could become a leading exporter of cars, manganese, and blueberries. So how do we get exports rights with our crumbling rails and port systems? Well, I think you've answered the question right there, which is that we need to fix the ports uh, and we need to fix the rail. I mean, it is remarkable how poorly our ports perform by international benchmarks. There are ports in the middle of Africa um, that perform better than ours. Uh, and we're getting lots of competition actually from Baira and from Maputo, um, both of which are rapidly increasing their throughput. And one of the suggestions that I make there is to concession off parts of the ports to international operators that are very experienced at port operations. And this is what almost every other country has done. So I use the example of the port of Shanghai in China, where the Chinese have concessioned that port. Uh, there's also a port in Brazil where throughput has substantially increased. And even in Mozambique, there's a collaboration between the government-owned ports authority and international company that does um, ports operations. And that has rapidly improved the throughput of Maputo. So Africa is one of the world's most unequal countries. Why is this problem so persistent? And you also point out in your book that different types of inequality have different effects. Can you also unpack that for us? Yeah, so we have an incredible un uh, inequality problem in South Africa. And I quote um, the research on this that suggests that a large part of the inequality problem is obviously driven by a lack of jobs. So, you know, many people in this country don't have, have work and so they don't earn any money and, and thus they are much poorer than everybody else. So really, we need to think about that as a key part of reducing the inequality problem. And for that, we need growth. And we all know this. And, and that we need to you know, get the electricity system to work uh, and we need to get the ports to work. Um, so in a way, those are all linked to one another. I distinguish between two types of inequality, inequality of outcomes and inequality of opportunities. Uh, and they're very interlinked because you can measure economic inequality of outcomes very easily because you can see that people um, just don't have the same access to resources, you know, at say age 30 or age 40. But it's quite difficult to measure inequality at the uh, access to, to resources when children, for example, are young. But I do make the point that they're very, very interlinked. And one of the big problems in this country is, of course, that poor children don't have access to the same educational opportunities that rich children do. And this drives inequality over many generations and over a person's lifetime. Now, in addition to inequality, South Africa has severe levels of poverty. Could a basic income grant assist in reducing these poverty levels? So I argue that uh, what we have at the moment is, I think, uh, as much as we can afford. So currently, the social grant system is very good. All the research suggests is it's very well targeted and it reaches the people that it needs to reach. Uh, it does cost a lot of money uh, and it's very extensive. So half the population receives a grant of some sort. Um, and it's actually very sad how successful the 350 Rand grant has been in terms of uh, reducing hunger and poverty amongst the very poor, uh, suggesting how desperate many people are. I don't think, and I quote some research that has been done, uh, it doesn't seem to me that uh, a very expansion of the amount that people receive is affordable for the country at the moment, uh, and we risk the chance of maybe shooting ourselves in the foot by making grants too expensive. But I suggest, though, that we keep the social relief of distress grant and convert it essentially into a basic income grant. Now, an ethical and effective government rounds out the six things that need to be done to fix South Africa. How could we improve the capability of our government? 
Yeah, so I distinguish between two things, capability and capacity. So capacity just refers to like the number of people that you have uh, and capability uh, refers to kind of how those people do their jobs and kind of how you stitch together how those people work. And I argue that we, we might actually be okay from a capacity perspective, but it's actually about getting the system to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, and one of the things, a very simple thing that, that has gone away actually, uh, uh, partly under the Zoom administration, uh, has been a proper performance system for the civil service. I've been a civil servant for for over twenty years, and you know when I started, we were on a on a performance contract, and we had bon. They weren't very generous bonuses, but we did get bonuses. Uh, if and it's all bell curved, so the best performers get better bonuses than everybody else, and all depends on on the outputs that you agree with your manager in the year advance. Exactly how it works in the private sector, and at the end of that period, you get a bonus. That system has been taken away. There's also been a huge pushback from the education unions to have any performance-based pay for teachers. You know, you can even have very simple performance-based pay, which is that the teachers needs to be present for four or five hours a day. I mean, that might be a start for performance. <laughs> um, or you could link it, maybe if you're being very creative, you could link it to improving the learning outcomes of the children. But that's a very, very simple thing to do. And then, I mean, I think, you know, we all know that corruption is deeply entrenched in society. Uh, and that is, I think it's become very, very widespread. And I really don't think that it's a, a government or private sector thing. I really don't think it's a white thing or a black thing or anything. I mean, we've seen Steinhoff has been an example of, you know, white corruption. We've seen black private sector corruption. We've seen, you know, everybody. And that is this deep lack of ethics in the country at the moment. And that needs a bigger thinking, like a moral regeneration of something of the nation, I think. Naro, you dedicate your book to the millions of South Africans without jobs. Can you just talk us through that decision? Yes. I mean, I think, uh, you know, one, one hopes that what one does has a small impact on the world. I don't know. This book has an impact, but I hope it has a small impact. And I am very frustrated by the fact that, you know, we have a lot of very good policies. Everything in my book, effectively, with one or two small exceptions, but everything in my book actually is government policy at the moment. Um, you know, the, the electricity policy is exactly almost as it is described, and actually it is being implemented. But the electricity white paper came out in 1998, and here we are in 2024, and, you know, they haven't implemented even the first part. Well, they've implemented a little bit of it. Um, and then the ports being another example. I mean, concessioning of the ports is government policy. Um, but for a variety of reasons, it hasn't been implemented. And then we've seen countries like Mozambique right next door implement basically our policies and become very successful um, and boom. Um, and, you know, Mauritius is another really good example of an African country that's been doing very well. And so, yeah, I think that uh, we almost, for their sake, for the millions of people without jobs, we just need to get this done. Lastly, Roy, your book takes an optimistic view of South Africa's issues. Does that mean you are optimistic about the future of the country, particularly as we head into a crucial election on the 29th of May? I hope so. I mean, I think obviously the outcome of the election will be absolutely critical. We are making progress in the right direction for economic reforms. And I do worry that if, uh, you know, there's a messy coalition that we'll forget about the economic reforms and we might become obsessed with um, positions and who is speaker and who is president and who is minister of this and minister of that. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've got this reform program that really needs to, to be accelerated. There's a team at the between the presidency and the treasury that does this called Operation Willandela, but one does worry about the future of them after the elections. Uh, and so, I mean, I am I hope reasonably optimistic that that de but it does really depend on the coalition. If there is a coalition, I mean, if the ANC obviously loses uh, overall power, the really interesting thing I highlight in my book is what happened in India in 1991, where Congress. Uh, they stayed in power, but they lost the majority and they came, I think they got about 31% of the 1991 vote. And they had to cobble together a minority government. And then they actually took the decision under Mohammed Singh, who was the finance minister, to implement uh, 
an extensive reform program, and that laid the basis for the India that we see today, which is uh, one of the fastest growing countries in the world and is, you know, has been booming over many, many years and millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in India. So there is also the possibility that, uh, you know, the elections might be the catalyst of, of a reform program. That was author Roy Hoverman discussing his book, How to Fix the Country, Six Things to Reboot South Africa.